All right, turn with me to Matthew 11. So today, 32 years ago today, we had our very first Sunday service. 32 years ago today, that just means I'm getting old. You know, I was thinking about it because it was 1989, the first Sunday in November, we were meeting at Pomona Elementary School. We'd just been going from doing a home fellowship for a number of months, and then we decided to go to Pomona Elementary School. I was the school custodian there for three and a half years, and then I was in the warehouse for the next three and a half years. And so when we thought, let's move out of our house, too many people there, it was getting crowded, let's go to meet and see, see if they'll let us meet at the school. And so I knew the principal there, and he tossed me, tossed me the key and said, you know how to clean up after yourself. You're the custodian here. So that's how we started 32 years ago. And I was thinking about it. I think there's only one pastor in Grand Junction that has been going longer than me. And I know there, Jim Etheridge, he's at Calvary Chapel Eastside in Colorado Springs. We started the same time together in 1989. I think we are now the senior, the oldest, whatever, pastors in Colorado at Calvary Chapel. So uh, praise the Lord, he is faithful. It just means God has a sense of humor to keep me around that long. So Matthew chapter 10, it was all about preparing the 12 disciples to go throughout Israel, proclaim to the Jewish people, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's because Jesus, the Messiah, the King, was among them. This was also a transition time for the 12. Uh, up to this point, they have been known as the 12 disciples. A disciple is one who is learning, who is watching, and now he's going to refer to them as apostles. And the apostle is one who is sent forth to do what Jesus has taught them to do. We saw that Jesus gave them his authority, his power to do many signs and wonders among the Jewish people in all these cities and villages they were going to. As we also saw in chapter 10, Jesus said, only go to the household of Israel. This is still Old Testament stuff that we're reading about because the church isn't born until the day of Pentecost. That's when the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon the disciples, and that's when they'd be able to fulfill what Jesus told them, now go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So the gospel now goes forth to everyone, and Jesus has commissioned us, his saints, he's given us his dunamis power of the Holy Spirit to do what he's called us to do. So chapter 11, verse 1, starts off saying, Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples, and earlier he'd called them apostles, that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. Again, he's following behind where he sent them. Now, again, we see this combination of preaching and teaching. Preaching is primarily, not only, but primarily to unbelievers. It's proclaiming the truth of God's word, proclaiming the gospel message of who Jesus is, why he came from heaven to earth, why he died, he shed his blood for our sins. So we proclaim, we preach the gospel. Romans 10, 14, it says, How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? <clears throat> Excuse me. How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So again, primarily to unbelievers, you preach the gospel. To believers, you primarily teach the word of God. You know, we know from Romans chapter 10, verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing Hearing by the Word of God. That's how we are built up in the faith through the Word of God, through hearing the Word of God. As believers, we are strengthened in our faith as the Word of God gets implanted into our hearts. So Jesus, again, He's going throughout Israel. He's preaching. He's proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand. And then He would teach them from His Word, from the Old Testament Scriptures, all about himself. And we see this pattern um, with the Apostle Paul throughout the book of Acts. He would proclaim the truth about Jesus. He would also teach the people about Jesus. And he would oftentimes go into synagogues because he was a rabbi. He could go into the Jewish synagogues and he would teach them 
from the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus is the one who fulfilled all the law and all the prophets. A great example of this is seen, look at these verses in Acts 17, verses 2 and 3. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I preached to you, is the Christ. So he preached, he taught them, and that's what Jesus is doing here. Now look at verse 2. So Jesus is out there proclaiming who he is, the King of the kingdom, Verse 2 says, And when John, this is John the Baptist, had heard in, uh, heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? So again, as he's traveling, these two disciples come from John the Baptist, and they have a question from John to Jesus. Are you the one or do we look for somebody else? Now, for many months, John has been locked up in prison. He is in Machaerus, which is on the Jordanian side of the Jordan River, pretty close to where he was baptizing. He was brought into prison by King Herod, and King Herod, um, you know, arrested him because John was one who was proclaiming that he was in sin because he had taken... Herod had taken his brother's wife, Herodias, and married her. So John is coming against that. But this is the same John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Jesus, who said, Behold the Lamb of God who is to come. This also tells us a little bit about the Jewish leaders. They had a lot of disdain for John, because not only did John the Baptist come against the political leaders, he also came against the religious leaders of, Ju uh, of Jerusalem and Judea the leaders of Israel, he was calling them, you're a bunch of brood of vipers. Well, that's not politically correct, but he didn't care about PC. He was calling them out. They were in sin. They were disobeying the law of God, that they were putting people under this heavy yoke. But after being in prison for almost a year at this point in the story here, John gets a little discouraged. Are you the coming one? Or should we really look for another? Why would he question this? Because John was, again, the last of the Old Testament prophets. And like all the Old Testament prophets, their emphasis about the coming Messiah was that he was going to kick out the enemies of Israel. The coming Messiah is going to set up his kingdom on earth. He's going to drive our enemies away. That was what they thought. That's what all the Old Testament prophets spoke of. What they forget forgot many of them spoke of it we read isaiah chapter 53 he's a prophet he spoke about the first coming of christ and that he would be a lamb led to slaughter but most of prophets they didn't get that they didn't understand that they're looking for the messiah to come and kick out all the the bad guys the the ru rulers of the world he's waiting for jesus to establish his kingdom to set up his kingdom on earth and so he didn't understand. There's two comings. The first is to die for our sins. That's the greatest enemy of all. It wasn't the Romans at this time. They weren't the worst enemies. You know, some people try to say, oh, China, that's our enemy. Russia, that's our enemy. No, the worst enemy has always been sin. And that's why Jesus came, to conquer, destroy sin. That was accomplished 2,000 years ago when he went to the cross. That is what the gospel is all about. He had to die he had to suffer. He had to shed his blood on the cross. He had to be put in the tomb. But he had to rise from the dead because if he didn't rise from the dead, then everything he did, everything he said would be meaningless. But because he conquered the grave, now he can offer the free gift of eternal life to anyone who will come to him by faith. That's all found in the Old Testament scriptures, but they primarily focused on the establishing of the kingdom of God. So again, John sends two disciples. They asked Jesus, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Again, in John's mind, something has gone terribly wrong. Again, he's been in prison for almost a year at this point, and he's thinking, how come he hasn't conquered our enemies? How come he hasn't wiped out the Romans? Why am I stuck in Herod's prison? So he sends to Jesus, 
Are you the one or should we look for somebody else? This is what you call a crisis in faith. John, man, he's a forerunner of Jesus. He said, this is the Lamb of God. He knew him. He was his cousin, by the way. And, but now he's starting to have these thoughts, these doubts. I, I wonder if I was really believing right, really teaching right. Even the so-called giants of the faith, as you go through the scriptures, you realize they had their moments of fear, moments of doubt. They had a crisis in faith at times where they became weak. Look at Moses. There's a couple times you read about in, in Exodus. He's ready to throw in the towel. I don't want to do this anymore, God. And then he'd humble himself and come back. Look at Elijah. He just has victory over the 430 you know, prophets of Baal and then 450 prophets of Baal. And then Queen Jezebel, I'm going to kill him. And then he gets afraid. He runs out in the wilderness. And he's thinking, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. Look at Jeremiah the prophet. He gets locked up in prison as well. And he goes, I don't even want to talk about you anymore, God. And then it says, the word of God burned in his heart. Jonah, David, Job, they all had this time where they question, they wonder, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing? I bring this up because we're living in times now where things are crazy. We're living in a mixed up world. The insanity of our nation's leaders are causing a lot of Christians to think, Lord, I don't understand what you're doing right now, but I'm trusting you. I know you're allowing things to happen. I know things are playing out the way you've known for eternity past. This is all part of your plan. So, Lord, give me strength, give me wisdom to cling to you and the promises of your word. Like John the Baptist here, we might not have everything figured out in our heads, but that's okay because you just need to remember Jesus has it all in control. He's got it all figured out. Our faith is in Him, not in our circumstances around us. So watch how Jesus responds to these disciples of John the Baptist. Verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel Preach to them. Pause there for a moment. So what, what did John's disciples hear? The good news. Jesus, the king, he is among us. What did they see? He's opening blind eyes, deaf ears. He's raising people from the dead. He's cleansing lepers. In other words, Jesus was fulfilling so many prophecies that Isaiah spoke of, that other prophets spoke of. He's telling these two men, go back to John and remind him of what I'm doing, because when John hears what Jesus is doing, then the bell you know, starts to ring in his ear. Oh yeah, he's fulfilling Isaiah chapter 11. He's fulfilling Isaiah chapter 35. He's fulfilling Isaiah chapter 61. These all speak of what Jesus was doing at this time. That is one of the greatest blessings of God's Word. And this is why I'm constantly exhorting all of you, spend time in God's Word. The Holy Spirit of God brings the Word to life within us. The Word of God is our roadmap. The Word of God gives us peace and comfort. It gives us direction. You can't go anywhere else but the Word of God to find God's heart and His mind for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. If you need comfort in your life today, this is what God's Word says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, all our struggles, all our hardships, everything we're going through, He can comfort us. That we, once you get through whatever you're going through, that we then may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble, notice, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And so he gives us comfort, and when we experience that comfort from the Lord, then we can comfort others with the same comfort that God gave us. We're giving that to other people. His word, it strengthens our faith. Again, as we saw earlier, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. God's Word reminds us of who Jesus Christ is, how much He loves us, the compassion He has for us, His plans and purposes for our lives. The Word of God is a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. The Word of God is a sharp, two-edged sword that drives the enemy's lies away from us. 
It drives the fear of the enemy away from us. When these two guys tell John that Jesus said, this is what I'm doing, it must have given John, who's in prison, waiting to be killed, beheaded, gives him great courage, great peace. It reassured him that he had fulfilled the very ministry that Jesus, that the Father, called John to do. Be the one who would prepare the way of the Lord. Now look at verse 6. This is an interesting verse. Jesus tells them before they leave, And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Again, a very interesting statement Jesus speaks here. The Greek word offended is scandalon. S-K-A-N-D-A-L-O-N. Scandalon. It means to stumble. Blessed is the man who's not stumbled or offended because of me. It means literally the bait stick. How you would entrap somebody and cause them to stumble. You put the bait stick in the trap, the animal would come, and then you'd be entrapped. So what Jesus is saying here is that be careful, John. Tell John these things. Blessed is he who is not stumbled, offended, caught in a trap of depression, discouragement, despair, because of what he thought Jesus should be doing or not doing. There's a lot of people that get caught up in things they think Jesus should be doing. Things are not going the way John the Baptist had hoped for. So he's saying, don't be tripped up by this, John. Don't stumble over this, John. My plans are higher, greater, bigger than your plans. Maybe you know someone who has stumbled over their expectations of what they thought Jesus should do in their lives. Maybe you have experienced scandal on in your own life. Some people approach the Christian life like this. They read, they get saved, they come to Jesus, they read their Bible, they go to church, they pray. And then they expect that their life should go a certain way. And then, if it doesn't, they stumble over things. They wrongly believe that with Jesus in their heart, everything's going to be one big party. It'll be smooth sailing, no storms, no problems. It'll be blue skies, calm waters. And so when the storms do come, they face trials and hardships. And sometimes, if their faith is in the circumstances around them, they stumble. They experience scandal on. What's going on, Jesus? I thought you said you came to give me abundant life. I thought when I came to you, everything would be wonderful. I thought all my problems would be behind me. I thought I, you know, you'd heal me of all my issues, and yet I'm still struggling in these things. I'm going through more hardships than ever before. It's true, Jesus did come to give us abundant life. But when he talks about abundant life, it literally means eternal life. He gave us eternal life. If you receive Jesus, you have eternal life. That's the greatest, most abundant life you can experience. You need to get off this you know, trad treadmill that people get on like Joel Osteen. This is your best life now. You should be experiencing all the blessings of God today. Your life should be wonderful. I, uh, I can't stand listening to that. It's just pop psychology, trying to pat you on the back, make you feel good. And if you're not doing these things, if you're not experiencing all these things, it's your lack of faith. That's garbage. Jesus also said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Take courage, I've overcome the world. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. In other words, we'll have our share of good days. We'll have our share of difficult days. But never forget, Jesus is with us every day. That's the bottom line. Whether it's a good day, bad day, hard day, fun day, Jesus is with us. And he says he'll never leave us or forsake us. And so we've got to keep our eyes on him. This is one of the reasons we need to be in the word of God, getting the whole counsel of God's word, because it gives us God's perspective on life, it gives us His wisdom concerning the things going on around us. And then when we understand, okay, I've got this trial, I've got this struggle, I've got this ailment, whatever it might be, 
He says in Romans 8.28, Paul says, And we know that all things work together. All things, yes, all things work together. By the way, the word for all in the Greek is what? All, yeah. <laughs> Even I know that. Yeah, all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. So we get God's understanding. And as we get His perspective about our lives, it will help us to not stumble over our misunderstanding of God's Word, over our misperceptions of who Jesus is and what He is doing. That's when we can trust the Lord as He starts to prune a dead branch off of our life. Remember, he's the vine dresser in John chapter 15, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he also says he prunes us. If you're a living tree and, you know, here comes the guy with the big pruners, Jesus, and he's like, "I'm gonna, that's not producing much fruit. You go, ow, why'd you do that? Because he's the master gardener. He knows what he's doing because in the long run, it's going to produce more fruit, he says. That's when we trust the Lord instead of questioning Him. Why are you doing this to me, Jesus? Well, look at verse 7. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? In other words, are you out there looking at, you know, for a two-faced politician that just goes whichever way the wind blows? Isn't that what politicians do? They just kind of oh, put their finger in there. Okay, which way is the wind blowing? I better go that way. They have no backbone. They, they don't stand up for what's right. It's like a wavering reed, Jesus says, in the wind. He, he said, did you see that in the wilderness with John? No, the people saw a man of God. They saw a man who spoke the truth of God's word. He preached repentance of sin. He told people to prepare their hearts for the coming of the Messiah. He called out the religious leaders as hypocrites. And again, he told the, pol the political leaders they were a bunch of sinners. And so Jesus is saying here, you didn't go out there into the wilderness to see a limp reed wavering in the wind of political correctness. Look at verse 8. But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. John wore a tunic made out of camel's hair. Just thinking about it makes me itch. Camels have really rough hair. He had a leather belt girdle around his waist. He was easy to spot in a crowd. They would say, his, you know, what was his meals? Wild honey and locusts. So it's like, go find the guy that's got the grasshopper legs and the honey in his beard, and that's John the Baptist. So he's easy to spot in a crowd. And I guarantee, I, and this is a guarantee, I guarantee John the Baptist would never be one who would be wearing Rolex watches, $10,000 suits. He would not be caught dead flying around in $53 million jets, going from $20,000 room, and this is a real false prophet on TBN, there's a bunch of them, by the way. And they'll go from one city to another, ripping people off, spending money like it's going out of style. John the Baptist would come against them. Brood of vipers, he would say. They're taking people's money. They're ripping people off. Verse 9, calm down. <laughs> but what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. What does Jesus mean by saying John was more than a prophet? It simply means that John was prophesied about by the other prophets. The prophets were pointing people to John, that he, what he would do in the future. He's the only prophet. He's an Old Testament prophet. He's the only one that said, this prophet's going to do this. Speaking of John the Baptist, that's why he's more than a prophet. One of the clearest prophecies concerning John's ministry is which Jesus quotes next. Look at verse 10. Jesus says, For this is he whom it is written, and he quotes from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, the last Old Testament prophet. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Again, this is what made John such a great prophet. He was called by God to be the forerunner of the Messiah, Jesus. Another Old Testament prophet spoke of John. That was Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 3. 
It says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And again, John did not waver at the Lord's calling. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. Now look at verse 11. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, which is pretty much everybody, right? That hasn't changed, folks. doesn't matter what they say. I believe science. Yeah, we're all born of women. There has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. Wow. But, take note of this, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is one of those verses a lot of people scratch their heads and they kind of wonder, how can that be? How can Jesus say, I'm greater than John the Baptist? I certainly don't think I'm greater than John the Baptist, but that's what he's saying here. This is why this is such an amazing truth that Jesus gives us. First of all, again, no one born among women is greater than John. Jesus says he's the greatest. Here's an interesting side note about John the Baptist. He did zero, zip, nada miracles. And yet he's called the greatest man born among women. Don't think that people that can do miracles are greater than John. No, no, no. John chapter 10, look at these verses, starting in verse 40. We read of Jesus, and he went away beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing first, and there he stayed. And this, this is right after John had been put to death. Then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, no miracles, but here's what made John so great. All the things that John spoke about this man, Jesus, were true. And many believed in him there. So John was the greatest because everything he said, everything he revealed about Jesus Christ was absolute, 100% true. The second amazing truth about this verse is what Jesus says about you and me. Again, and all those who receive Christ as Lord and Savior, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven, notice, is greater than John the Baptist. Again, how can that be? If John's the greatest born among women... How can any of us be greater than John? Well, the simple answer is, like John, all of us have been born through a woman giving birth to us. That's a fact. But here's our advantage. You and I, we have been born again. John did not experience the same relationship with Jesus that you and I can. That's why he says it's greater than what John experienced. John didn't experience that same relationship. We alone, the body of Christ, we alone are the bride of Christ. That's important. John looked at himself as the best man at a wedding. Hey, it's great to be the best man at a wedding, but it's not as good as being the bride, getting married to the husband, the groom. John knew this. He understood this relationship. He even talks about this. This is in John the the Apostle John wrote in John 3, verses 28 to 30. Again, this is John the Baptist speaking. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride, again, you and I are the bride, is the bridegroom. That's Jesus. But the friend of the bridegroom, that's John speaking of himself, the best man, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Again, that's why our relationship with Jesus is even greater than what John the Baptist had with Jesus. Awesome. Look at verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. This is one of those scriptures that some people struggle with. Some people use this scripture to try to justify blowing up abortion clinics. Not so. Some have used this to try to justify raiding the U.S. Capitol. That's not what it's referring to. You, this is speaking about 
Jesus referring to the treatment that the Old Testament prophets suffered. They had tremendous violence done against them. Manasseh, the wicked king over Judah, had Isaiah sawn in two. Jeremiah thrown in a dungeon. All of them suffered greatly for their trusting God and His Word. These leaders were dishing out punishment against John the Baptist. Again, he was thrown in prison. He would soon be put to death. That rejection of John was similar to what Jesus was going to experience. Suffer violence. He was going to be arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. They would beat him. Isaiah tells us that he was marred or beaten up more than any other person where you couldn't even recognize who he was. They beat him so severely. They whipped him with the cat of nine tails, ripping off his back. They nail him to a cross. They stick the spear in his heart, out blood, pours blood and water. He's referring to himself as well. They would violently arrest him, beat him, crucify him. We also saw, remember in chapter 10, last time Jesus spent most of that chapter warning his disciples about the persecution they were going to face in the future. All persecutions that would come upon them, that would be the result of preaching the gospel, telling people about Jesus. So the bottom line is God's people cannot remain neutral in the face of persecutions and hardships. We need to stand strong in the Lord. We need to stand strong in Christ. We need to fight the good fight, Paul says. What does that mean? Blow people away? No. Use the sword of the Spirit. It's a spiritual battle. Paul says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly. We don't kill people. We don't put knives or you know, swords at people's throat and say, you know, repent or die. That's not the Christian way. Our weapons are not carnal, but spiritual for pulling down strongholds. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God, because it's a spiritual battle. If any of you think, well, i got to go around and beat people up for the kingdom of God, you're missing this verse. It's not what it says. We're to finish the race that Jesus has set before us, telling people the good news of Christ. Isaiah 54, 17, we sang this earlier. It says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. Again, it's a spiritual battle. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. You're declared righteous, not because you can prove it by beating up more people than somebody else. Samson did it with a donkey's jaw, trying to prove how righteous he was. That's not the new covenant, the New Testament. We proclaim the power of the gospel, which alone is the power unto salvation to everyone who believes. Now look at verse 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So John the Baptist, he's the last of the Old Testament prophets. They were prophesying about the coming of the Messiah. When Jesus says here in verse 14, if you're willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. Think about this. Remember when the Pharisees came to John the Baptist and they asked him, are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? He said, no, I am not. He told him very clearly. Jesus is telling us that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. Remember when Peter, James, and John, they went up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. And as they're up there, all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah appear in their glorified bodies. And Jesus takes on his glorified nature. Peter's all excited. Oh, Lord, we should build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. And then God interrupts him and says, you know, quiet, Peter. Basically, shut up, Peter. This is my beloved son. Hear him. It's all about Jesus. And so... Moses and Elijah disappear. They're walking down the mountain. And are on their way down, they ask Jesus, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Here's his answer. Look at Matthew 17, verses 11 to 13. Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. 
But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished, cutting off his head. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Again, John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. If the people of Israel would have received Jesus as their Messiah, repented of all their sins, and received him as Lord and Savior, then John would have fulfilled Elijah's ministry as well. But that was not going to happen because Elijah is coming. He is prophesied. He will come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which is a reference to the great tribulation when God's wrath is poured out upon his enemies of this world. That will take place during the seven years of great tribulation. The first three and a half years is when we see Elijah and I believe Moses in the book of Revelation. But this is what it says. Look at the very last verses of Malachi, the Old Testament, Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. These are the very last two verses. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So again, where do we find Elijah in the last days? I believe it's in Revelation chapter 11. There's two witnesses that are sent by God, and for the first three and a half years, they tell people in Israel, they're, they're there at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, repent! Turn to Jesus! Don't believe the Antichrist. They're warning people about the destruction of the Antichrist, the lies of the Antichrist. We're told that they are given power by God to call fire down from heaven, turn the water to blood, stop the rain from falling, and strike the earth with various plagues. Sounds exactly like what Elijah and Moses did. But then, at the end of the first three and a half years of the seven-year Great Tribulation period, God will allow the Antichrist to put them to death. It's interesting, as you read Revelation 11, the Antichrist puts them to death and their bodies stay in the streets for three and a half days. And this is why we know it hasn't happened yet, it's still future, because it tells us very clearly that the whole world will see their bodies lying in the streets of Jerusalem. For three and a half days. The whole world is going to throw a big party and they're going to rejoice over this. This is what it says, Revelation 11, verse 10. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, over the two dead prophets. Make merry. They're just celebrating. Send gifts to one another. So Hallmark will quickly establish a new holiday. Happy Dead Prophets Day. <laughs> Amazon stock will quickly spike. They'll be sending gifts. Notice, they send gifts to one another. Because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. But we're told that their celebration quickly comes to an end because God's Spirit comes into these two prophets. Again, I believe Elijah for sure and probably Moses. It says they ascend before them and it says the whole world sees them. Well, you can't see anything on the other side of the earth unless it's today with satellites and everything else. You can see an event happen live anywhere in the world. Back then, no, maybe if somebody down the street, they wouldn't see them rise up. They couldn't see it. But today they can. This is a prophecy yet to be fulfilled. When they ascend back up into heaven, that's when the Antichrist goes into the rebuilt temple that's in Jerusalem at that time. When does the seven-year period start? The Antichrist comes, and the first thing, this is the beginning of the seven years, it says in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, he signs a peace treaty with the Jews, and that allows them to rebuild the temple. As soon as that treaty is signed, the Jews start to build. That's the beginning of the seven years. So they're building the temple. These prophets are prophesying, don't listen to the Antichrist. You repent. That temple is not God's temple. It's the Antichrist temple because they're put to death. And then Jesus says in Matthew 24, 15, and again, we'll slow way down when we get to Matthew 24, he tells the Jews, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, he says, let the reader understand the abomination of desolation. 
is when the Antichrist goes into the rebuilt temple, says, worship me, I'm God. When that happens, Jesus tells the Jews, flee Jerusalem, get out of Israel. And it says, they will, he says, pray that your flight is not on the Sabbath. That's because he's speaking to the Jews. They flee out into the wilderness. Their flight, it's an interesting term, their flight, because in Exodus, when they're fleeing uh, Egypt, going into the wilderness, they sing a song that Miriam comes up with that song, the Song of Moses, and they talk about how they were on eagle's wings during their flight out of Egypt. It's just God's way of saying He takes them out into the wilderness where God will provide for them for the final three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. Anyway, I got off track there, sorry. When that event happens, they flee. The Lord will prepare a place for them for three and a half years. But now look at verse 16. But to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions, saying, we played the flute for you, and you did not dance. So it's like kids, hey, we want to play wedding, but nobody wanted to play wedding. We mourn to you, and you did not lament. Hey, let's play funeral. <laughs> nobody wants to play funeral. He says, this is just how this generation is. It's like this today. Verse 18, for John came neither eating nor drinking. I mean, he was teetotaler or whatever you want to say. I mean, he was on that straight and narrow. And they said, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But notice wisdom is justified by her children. Here, Jesus is rebuking those who come against John the Baptist. We don't like him. He's too harsh. He says things that are too mean. You know, he's getting on our case. We don't like how he's rebuking us. He's calling us a brood of vipers. He's so mean. It's sad. He's stern. He's not dancing to our tune. I think he has a demon, they said. They're the same people who would come against Jesus. We don't like him either. He's too loving. He's too compassionate. He forgives sinners. And he's hanging out with these sinners all the time. He's a glutton. He's a wine bibber. He must have a demon too because he's doing so many miracles. Folks, there was no pleasing these people. When Jesus says they're like children in the marketplace, he's simply saying, you're like the little kids who don't know if they want to play Marriage or wedding, they want to play funeral. They don't know what they're doing. There's no pleasing these people. John's too harsh. Jesus is too gracious. You cannot win with people like that. They'll reject truth, and then they hide behind a mask of criticism. And many of us have been the recipients of their criticism, always finding fault in what other people do, what other people say. And I discovered a long time ago as a pastor that I'm never going to make people happy. I can never please everybody. And it's so freeing because I don't even try. I'm not trying to please you. I'm trying to please Jesus. He's the one I got to stand before. He's the one that's going to hold me accountable for what I teach. He's the one that I'm going to stand before, and he's going to say, hopefully, well done, good and faithful servant. But whatever hay, wood, and stubble I've got in my life, it's all going to burn up. So i got to answer to him. And so for many years, when I'm preparing a sermon, my prayer is simply, Holy Spirit of God, please bring your word to life within me because I want your word to glorify you, and I want this message to edify your people. And I know when that comes together, this last line in verse 19 comes to life when he says, but wisdom is justified by her children. In other words, God's wisdom is shown by you and I as God's children, simple, humble people who have been changed by the creator of the heavens and the earth. We've been born again by the blood of the Lamb. Our simple, childlike faith is why we are saved we simply put our faith, our trust in Christ alone for our salvation. Listen, all the world's critics, all the world's atheists, all the skeptics that come against us, they can argue, they can debate, 
And you can enter into those debates and it's pretty much futile, worthless. But what are they mad at? They were saying, Jesus loves me. He died for me. He's preparing a place for me in glory. A day is coming when he's coming back for me and he's going to receive me to himself. Jesus has forgiven me of every sin. We're new creations in Christ. We've been given the free gift of everlasting life. Jesus is about to sound the trumpet. And when the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. It's all His doing. We're just going along for the ride. Wisdom is justified by her children. God's wisdom has been proven out in your life. That He chose you. He separated you from the things of this world. He bought you off that slave market of sin. His blood has washed all your sins away. The world can argue and debate all they want about that. But wisdom is proven. Because God has changed you. And He's going to bring you home to be with Him forever and ever.